At Pepperdine, you'll not only see policy differently, you'll see your future differently from here too. Good morning. My name is Pete Peterson and I'm Dean of Pepperdine School of Public Policy. And on behalf of the school and our colleagues at the Fred Sands Institute of Real Estate, I'd like to welcome you here today to the Pepperdine DC University building for this morning's discussion, the future of housing, protecting taxpayers and ensuring a robust secondary housing market. As the policy school enters its 20th anniversary, we remember one of our founders, the late great political scientist, Dr. James Q. Wilson. It was Wilson who taught us a couple very important lessons. Uh, first, that there's always a public in public policy, that it's not just about the experts making decisions, that the public always needs to be consulted and considered in the formation of public policy. And second, the importance of the concept of unintended consequences, that even under the best of intentions, the results of policy can have consequences that go far beyond original intentions. It would be hard to conceive of a set of uh, policy discussions or an area of public policy that is more public facing and yet is fraught with the concept of unintended consequences than the financing of our housing markets. And as someone who lives in the great city of Santa Monica, California, I can say that this is an area of great importance as the state itself has just reached a, a median household cost of half a million dollars. These questions that relate to the affordability of housing are questions that are very important to us at the policy school and to the state of California. You have in, on your uh, chairs or on your desks uh, the brochure that has all the bios of this uh, great and diverse panel. Uh, just a quick introduction as we move to my left, Ron Haney, Senior Vice President for uh, Mortgage Finance Policy at the Independent Community Bankers of America. Uh, to his left, Landon Parsons, Senior Advisor for Moellis & Company. To his left, Michael Stegman, Fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Our friend uh, from Los Angeles, Richard Green, Director of the Lusk Center for Real Estate at the University of Southern California. And finally, Jerron Levy, uh, to his left, the Director of Policy and Government Affairs at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Uh, moderating this conversation this morning, we are honored to have uh, Lorraine Waller, financial services reporter for uh, Political Pro. And so the format for this discussion today is Lorraine's going to lead this conversation, one that I know from uh, our early, earlier uh, conference calls was very fruitful. And uh, we will open it up to questions from you all. And then finally, my colleague and friend Greg Morrow at the Fred Sands Institute of Real Estate will close us. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lorraine Wooler. Thanks everyone and welcome. I'm just gonna kick this off. We're gonna start at a really high level here. We're all here to talk about GSE reform, Fannie and Freddie reform. And I thought we'd start by maybe illustrating how a lot of people are on the same page when it comes to Fannie and Freddie. So let, let's, let's explain to the audience what it is that we are trying to do when we're reforming Fannie and Freddie. What are, what are our objectives? And I'm gonna take the easy one and say that we're gonna we wanted, we're trying to preserve the 30-year fixed mortgage, which relies on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA. But what else? What else are we trying to do as we embark on reform? And I'm just going to start here, Ron. Okay, thanks. And uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, you know, what needs fixing? Um, I think the good news is there's a lot that actually works very well with the system. In fact, if you use the system, you'll see it actually works extremely well. It's very efficient. And it worked actually pretty well all through the crisis. Um, so that's sort of the good news about it. Um, you know, there are things that definitely need to be addressed. Uh, the first one we believe is uh, we got we to gotta improve taxpayer protection, and that means that translates to capital. They don't have capital. They're running out of capital. Uh, they'll be at zero capital by the end of the year. 
Uh, this is a self-inflicted crisis, which we need to reverse, and we need to do that now. Uh, and so that needs to be fixed, you know, immediately. Um, I know others will disagree with this, but a line of credit is not capital. A line of credit does not protect taxpayers. In fact, a line of credit from the Treasury is a draw on taxpayers. I don't care how you color it, it's still the same. And so uh, that needs to be avoided, I believe, or ICBA believes, at all costs. And then I think uh, the other things are we need to maintain access. We need to make, maintain access for lenders of all sizes, all shapes, all charter types, all business models. Uh, and uh, the system cannot be um, you know, turned over to you know, the biggest too big to fail players out there. And, so, uh, and it needs to be easy to use. So I'll, I'll stop probably with those, and we'll move it on down the line. Landon. Uh, my name is Landon Parsons, and I'm actually a little different on this uh, panel because I'm an investment banker. And I wanted to say that because um, I do have clients who have skin in the game, and specifically I advise the uh, non-litigating uh, preferred shareholders in Fannie and Freddie. So having said that, um, my biggest I, uh, concerns about the current market uh, includes uh, Mr. Haney's uh, position on we have the two largest insurance companies in the United States who uh, basically have zero capital at the end of the year. And um, uh, at the end of the day, I, I sort of, the way I was brought up to believe, I sort of believe that uh, taxpayers are not capital, and capital is capital. So we need to create a circumstance where we can protect the taxpayers from situations where we have uh, zero capital in the entities. Um, Pete said early on about this is a topic that has significant unintended consequences. And I think one of the major unintended consequences we need to be very focused on is the impact of entities without zero capital on affordable housing. Uh, specifically, there is uh, <clears throat> today there is uh, four basis points of all new UPB being produced that is going into the capital magnet trust fund and the housing trust fund, uh, which goes a long way to supporting uh, affordable housing goals and needs in the United States. Um, and if there should be a draw on the treasury uh, for just gap accounting anomalies, then you end up at a circumstance where the funds for those two trust funds, which were very hardly negotiated back in 2007 and 2008, uh, would actually be shut off if you follow the waterfall that's currently in the documents. So uh, my, my main points are um, no capital at the end of the year, all sorts of unintended consequences, including very dramatic ones, potentially on affordable housing. Michael. Yeah, I mean, we're uh, almost at the ninth anniversary of the government, <coughs> really, stewardship of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. And so we're in a situation um, where we have a regulator conservator having to approve all new mortgage products. I mean, innovation really gets slowed and, and stifled in a, in a situation like that. Um, I think this broad, uh, there is some pretty broad agreement about legislative uh, kind of principles for reform, and there is a big question of whether we're going to be able to find a bipartisan legislative solution. But one of those is right now the government has an implicit guarantee of the companies of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, I think there's a broad kind of bipartisan agreement that if there is going to be a continuing government guarantee in the secondary mortgage market, it should be at the mortgage-backed security level. It should not be at a company level. Uh, we should be in a situation where there is uh, enough competition and private capital standing behind that guarantee that um, a guarantor should be allowed to fail, uh, try to end uh, the big, right, the too big to fail. Um, there should be a more competitive landscape. I thought it was interesting a couple of weeks ago when Fed Governor Powell gave a speech on GSE reform, uh, the notion of endowing just two companies um, with an implicit guarantee 
uh, he said, would be like really just giving two banks access to FDIC insurance and having all the other banks trying to compete. Uh, so developing a more competitive landscape where innovation is encouraged is, is very important. And the benefits of that guarantee must be broadly available to all qualified borrowers, all geography, low and moderate income uh, families across the business cycle. Richard? So first of all, I just want to say I took uh, American government as a freshman in college 40 years ago from James <laughs> Q. Wilson. And I still remember some of his lectures. So it's, a, it's an honor to be part of this today. Um, the second thing I'm going to say is, since I'm a professor um, and uh, have no hope in working at administration anytime soon, <laughs> I can say whatever I want. And the first thing I'm going to say is I'm going to take a little bit of issue with your premise that we want to preserve the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And this is something I've been giving a lot of thought to in the last month or so. Um, it may be a product that's not the best consumer product that we could make our standard product uh, for the following reason. Uh, even when there's no interest rate incentive for people to repay their mortgages, they prepay them at a minimum rate of 12% a year. Um, you add that to amortization, after 10 years, you have about 77% of mortgage balances paid. And so people are paying a premium for the 30 years, and they're not using the benefit of that over the 30 years. The vast majority of people are not using that benefit. And that me might mean that they're locked into a more expensive mortgage product than is necessary. And so, just so since we're at a time of disruption, uh, we should at least rethink whether we want this to be the model mortgage. And the other problem I have with the 30-year fixed rate mortgage is people save so slowly via it. Um, it came about because as interest rates rose, it was the only way people could afford to buy houses, and that was fine. But now that interest rates have fallen again, um, shorter terms might be more appropriate, which would allow people to build equity more quickly. So I hope that's an issue we can talk a little we bit did. about. The other thing I want to talk about is access to credit. So where the problem we, one of the problems we have right now, beyond the capital <coughs> issues, which have already been discussed quite well, is Fannie and Freddie are basically now in the business of making loans that have nearly a zero probability of default. If you look at their books since 2008, their originations uh, since 2008, their default rates are astonishingly small. And if you're doing the mortgage business right, you should have some defaults. Um, the typical Fannie Freddie mortgage has a FICO score of 750. Um, the average FICO score in the US is in the high 600s. Okay, so what does this mean? What do we have right now? Who is doing all of the access to credit work? right now. It's FHA and VA and rural housing. So the taxpayer effectively is doing the heavy lifting right now because the taxpayer does explicitly back those institutions. We could talk about whether they have adequate capital or not, but to think that by just letting things continue as they are, we are not putting the taxpayer at risk. Even if Fannie and Freddie never take their draw, I think is uh, misconstrued. Jaron. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Jerron Levi, and I, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition is a coalition of about 600 organizations, and we represent, you know, affordable housing advocates, fair housing organizations, community reinvestment groups, voices like that. We are in the debate because we are very concerned about the implications of the debate for the provision of access to credit for low and moderate income borrowers and communities and underserved communities, including minority and rural ones. So first, a point of agreement with my fellow panelists uh, on the need for a capital buffer at the enterprises. Specifically, that's not just our opinion. Uh, Director Mel Watt, the conservator and regulator, said it is the most serious risk that they face and the issue that has the greatest likelihood of escalating in the future. So that's what the regulator said. They need a capital buffer. Uh, also on the, the impact of the long-running conservatorship, that needs to be fixed. 
nine years, it, it's having real cost on the ground. Uh, one thing, one of which Mr. Morrill just mentioned, you can imagine in conservatorship, they're being very conservative. Uh, and so um, they are not providing the leadership in the market around affordable housing and access to credit that we would like. Also, uh, you know, we're at a 50 year low in home ownership. Home ownership is really the chief wealth building tool uh, for low and moderate income people. This is the greatest asset that they, ha they have. And in a country where we see a racial wealth gap growing, uh, an income wealth gap growing, uh, a, a, an affordable housing crisis more or less, and uh, shrinking federal support, uh, both on the appropriation side and potentially on as a part of tax reform. We really need these enterprises functioning in the marketplace and not all of their profits being swept in the Treasury and being sp spent elsewhere. So capital needs to be fixed, the conservatorship needs to end, and we need a stronger presence uh, for these enterprises in mitigating the home ownership uh, issues, the affordable housing crises, and to do more around uh, affordable home ownership and affordable housing in the market. Okay, so, so let me sort of connect the dots. We have the, the capital coming in at the top, coming down through the system and down to the home buyer. Um, so the problem is right now, home buy not an, home not not enough home buyers can get mortgages. Is that what you're saying, Jerron? Um, People who want to buy a house can't always because they can't get a loan. They can't get a loan, and as uh, Mr. Morrill mentioned, I mean green. they're green. I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, not that I mind being confused they, with They Craig, are heavily reliant. <laughs> Let's put it like this: the conventional side of the market isn't doing its share. It's all you know, non-conventional FHA, VA lending, and the average credit scores are quite high. I mean, uh, so yes, it is true. People who have in the past been able to access home ownership can't access it. So, so Ron, why is that? Why can't you know my mom get a loan? Well, I think it's a combination of things. It's not uh, clearly the GSEs and uh, the lenders that sell loans and service loans for the GSEs have taken a much more conservative stance since the crisis. And the reason for that is because they have long memories. In other words, uh, you know, during the crisis, what happened? Well, there were lots of loans that went into default. Now, some went into default because they were just poorly underwritten. And, that's all there was to it. They were poorly underwritten, there were bad products, whatever you want to call it. Um, others went into default because people just lost their jobs. And you know, the loan at the time it was made was perfectly underwritten according to the program guidelines and things of that nature. But unfortunately it went into default and then the GSEs as well as the mortgage insurance companies and, and even I think even to, to some degree even FHFA you know, found ways to put loans back to lenders or make them, uh, you know, make either the GSEs hold or FHA hold. And so people have long memories about that. And so, you know, when you have to buy back a loan as somebody who had to go to a board and say, hey, we need to write a check for $150,000 because we have to buy back this loan. Oh, by the way, the property's been liquidated. So you're just going to write a check for $150,000. Um, that might not be a lot of money in Washington, D.C., but I can tell you in Idaho, it's a lot of money for, for a bank board to approve. And so you're not going to do that multiple times. So people are going to be reluctant. Yeah, that, and then you add on top all the mortgage rules that have come out since the crisis. And those, you know, you're figuring you've got about 6,000 pages of rules, at least. And, um, and not to say that we don't need those rules or that, you know, there's not a good purpose behind them. But those rules, number one, are expensive to implement. It, create, it increased the cost to originate a loan and to service a loan. It's at least doubled it. In some cases, tripled it. And so then what's, what does that do to the, how does that impact access to credit? It makes a lender more cautious to make a loan that actually might go delinquent. Um, and, and so again, people that are, may be you know, more marginal, lower credit scores, you know, you have to stretch a ratio to, you know, yeah, the, the DTI shouldn't be f more than 43%. They're at 50. Um, you know, loans that might have been made, and these are good loans. These are not, these aren't, you know, ninja loans or whatever. 
but lenders are reluctant to do that because the cost of making an error is so great. Okay, so let's, um, let's set aside the mortgage regulations for just a minute and talk about your first point, which is you guys are gun shy. PTSD, we don't want to go through this again. The GSEs have gone a long way toward fixing that problem. True. Um, so what's wrong, like now? I mean, just talk, Landon, talk a little bit about <coughs> Well, I think that. The, I think the biggest issue right now is um, I'm trying to pull from the back of my memory, but I believe about a year ago, last summer, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal where they had done a summation as of that point of all the major fines that had been paid uh, by the mortgage industry and in particular the two big to fail banks for representation and warranties issues, fraud issues, sales practice issues, uh, things of that nature. And uh, the number as of last summer was something like $110 billion. And we just saw uh, recently with the RBS settlement that there's at least been another $5 billion added to that. <clears throat> so the banks facing basically low, very low cost of funds right now can handsomely make their returns and, and, and fill out their allocations towards uh, residential mortgages pretty easily with the prime jumbo market. They can earn uh, pretty nice spreads, very good spreads on a risk-adjusted basis and have to pay very little for their cost of funds to support that because they're basically holding it on a balance sheet. But as a result of these uh, large reps and warranty fines and a basic distrust of the securitization system at this point, particularly the private label security system, those lenders who would naturally be making uh, conforming loans and loans that would not be prime jumbo loans um, don't have access to the depth of capital that they used to have because first off the conventional m window is not buying them at the um, Fannie and Freddie and the private label security market is basically dead. So as a result of that those who should be actually making these loans can't get access to the funds. Those who have the funds, board of directors won't let them take on extra credit because they're, there's, they're no making, incentive. there's no incentive to do it. So there's a perverse, another one of these unattended consequences, there's a perverse unattended consequence in the market for no one to be basically lending at a 680 FICO north. And remember, 680 FICO is roughly prime. And right. the average the average FICO um, being done through the conforming market now is 740. Mm -hmm. 680 to 740, I, I've never seen it on a bell curve, but I would, I would assume that that certainly falls in the mode, the median, and most of the area under the curve. It does, yeah. So, okay, so, but that's what FHA is here for, so, Michael, Michael no problem, so, right? So, the, uh, there's, there's really kind of a paradox uh, here because the gold standard for the buyback threat, the rep and warrant issue is really what uh, FHFA um, and the GSEs negotiated over the last several years. Uh, much more certainty, uh, quality control up front if the loan passes quality control and there's a 36 month uh, continuous payment. Uh, you're released, all of that thing, and yet you still have that real constraint on anything below 680 and, and so on. You're not seeing come through the GSEs. If you go to FHA, the threat of treble damages and the litigation issues around justice, um, and yet all of the lower income, right, and the higher risk stuff is still going through FHA, but what you have is the big banks, right, um, JP Morgan, and have really pulled back because of the litigation threat. And now you have overwhelmingly non-banks uh, really supporting the, the FHA program, and that's getting to be an increasing concern. Um, and, and so why, why are the GSEs not getting some of those loans? And it, in part, it seems to me it's long memory plus the fact we've not been through another cycle. And so even with that real gold standard rep and warrant regime in place, they're still not 
trusting the MIs, they're not trusting the GSEs. Gotcha. Okay. Without another, and we, it's gonna boy, it's like this. So oh, so okay. My mom can get a loan if she goes through FHA, but maybe she's a riskier borrower, and that is that then is on the taxpayer more and more. Um, meanwhile, the, the, the lenders going through the GSEs are doing sh you know, funneling only their safest loans, uh, lowest risk loans, biggest profit loans. Um, and so you have a market that's building, basically a lending market that's because of our policy infrastructure is um, this market is growing bigger when, you know, around the wealthier sort of upper middle class. We have this really bifurcated, bifurcated housing system, right? right? So, Jaron, what pick well, up on this? It, it, the conversation points up two things. First of all, if you did not have uh, uh, structures in the market like the affordable housing goals mm -hmm. and the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, these affirmative obligations on the conventional market to serve low and moderate income borrowers and underserved communities, they wouldn't be served in a market like this, okay? So it points up the need to have strong affordable housing obligation because this segment would be, and it's still happening, you know, they would be boxed out and priced out. Part of the issue is the pricing as well and uh, much greater risk-based pricing at the enterprises, okay? so. You know what the it, what the enterprises would say is that they're losing the price war with FHA, and you know below a, a 680 credit score, on a pricing, from a pricing standpoint, it, it it doesn't make sense to go the conventional route or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, but that's a problem, in our view. So anyway, it points up the fact that you need the affordable housing goal. It also points up the fact at the enterprises in conservatorship, they are not doing the things to help the private market along that they could be doing. They're being too conservative. Yeah, product innovation, outreach, investments, grant making. There's a lot they could do in the marketplace to bring, to tell the conventional market, it's safe, come back in, you know. So I, he I see a lot of heads nodding and you guys are in agreement on a lot of these sort of high concepts. So, so let's try to explain why then, if there's agreement on you know what these problems are, why can't we fix them? And, I, and I'd like you to get like a little bit into the weeds, like politically, um, and in you know with the industry. Um, so, you know, the banks want reform, the housing, the housers want reform, the capital markets want reform. We all want um, access to home ownership, access to credit, and to, we all want to protect the taxpayers. Can we agree on that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let's do it. <laughs> Come on. Legislatively or administratively? <laughs> let's talk about that in a minute, maybe. What, what is, let's, let's lay out the sort of landscape politically. What's preventing the fix? Ron, Ron I'm gonna just make you answer okay. this. <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, well, I think there's two things. One is that, uh, there's a lot of ideology around this. You know, how much of a role should the government play in supporting housing? And uh, there's been a lot of discussion and debate about that. That gets down to should uh, the government provide the, uh, ex an, an explicit guarantee on conventional loans uh, when we already have, you know, 100% government-backed programs, et cetera. So you've got that in the mix. Um, I would suggest, too, that there's, there's the issue is that uh, the GSEs themselves are two very large businesses. There's a lot of money on the table, so to speak. And that, you know, when there's lots of money on the table, there's lots of folks that like to have a piece of the action. And, um, and the fact that, uh, you know, if you go back, you know, 35 years in this business, um, you didn't have all the big national large players out there. You had sort of like big regional players maybe, but you didn't have mega banks like you have today. And now you've got, you've got institutions that by themselves are bigger than the GSEs. Give us an example. Well, you didn't have uh, companies like Wells Fargo uh, that's, you know, a multi-trillion dollar institution, national reach, global reach, 
and they are very sophisticated. They can do it all. They don't need Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and nor do they want to live by their rules, probably, because uh, <coughs> they can say, hey, we can deploy our capital just as easily, and we can do it to benefit our shareholders. Uh, so they don't want to play by those rules. I, I completely understand that. But then you've got a situation where you've got uh, our constituency, community banks, there's no way we can do it all. And so we rely on the GSEs to be there. So there's this huge, I think there's a, a big divide based on size and sophistication in the marketplace. And that, that has to get resolved. Big banks, little banks. Landon? Well, I, I think at the end of the day, the you know one of the biggest issues with this issue is is this big bank, small bank kind of conversation, sure. and then there's a lot of other politics involved in what we should actually do with the infrastructure that supports let, let's the situation. Let's spell that out really um, in basic terms. Yeah. The infrastructure is a securitization well, sort of system. Well, the infrastructure, to, you know, <laughs> if you stop and think historically, uh, Fannie and Freddie had basically three functions. One is the guarantee function, where they guarantee the mortgages that they are associated with. They have a securitization function, where for smaller institutions like Ron represents, people sell the loans directly to what's called a cash window, as opposed to aggregators, which would keep them from uh, being able to earn the most maximum profit on their underlying uh, transaction. And then the third thing that the GSEs traditionally had as their business model was the uh, investment model, where they, you know, it was a failed business model where they, uh, you know, took on government proceeds and purchased private label securities with them. That was a failure. We all know that was a bad part of the business model. And I think universally across everybody's proposals, nobody suggests that we go back to that. <coughs> So we're basically left with the guarantee function and the securitization function. And the securitization function is what I refer to as the infrastructure. So that's the ability to have a forward TBA market so institutions can appropriately hedge their fixed versus So, so my mom can lock in her rate so before she mom can lock in before her rate she buys her house and before closes. she locks her rate. But he, because what happens then is if that small bank can't lock in that rate, or that specialty finance company can't lock in that rate, they cannot appropriately hedge that, and they can't be exposed to the interest rate and the profitability and affordability that goes along with that. So I think one of the biggest issues from a political standpoint that has been <coughs> facing people is there's been a very strong divide how the infrastructure should be put together. There was the formation of the common securitization platform under the original Corker Warner outlay where people were used thought of turning that into a guarantor and calling it something called ethnic. Okay, and then in the most recent Milken Institute, the DeMarco Bright paper, they were talking about possibly, well, let's take Ginny May as opposed to the CSP and use that as a structure. All at the same time, though, you have Fannie and Freddie that already have structures that people recognize, they know how to use, and they are extremely functional for small and regional lenders to have access well, to. Well, let's, so the, those structures, though, yeah. could be potentially really profitable to whoever controls them. I mean, so for, as far as Wall Street is concerned, you know, is there a, a political tension between people who want to get in on this game and people who think, let's just keep the infrastructure we have and kind of tweak it to make it a little better? Well, if, if you want to take Wall Street's perspective, I think you need to define who Wall Street is. <laughs> and if you define Wall Street as being um, the large bank securitization platforms or the large banks themselves that self-fund themselves, uh, in that respect, they have securitization structure. The reason that the private label securities market does not work today is not because there's not a CSP or not because there isn't a, a Ginny May function. They know how to securitize. They did it for you know over a decade and a half and, of, of successfully doing that until we hit the financial crisis. The infrastructure is not the issue. The, infra the issue is access to infrastructure, and you have to have who Fannie. owns it. Who owns you the owns infrastructure, it. and who? who's allowed to use it. So in this case, uh, the large banks don't need the infrastructure. They have their own infrastructure. So creating systems where they have access to infrastructure that they don't need 
through a mutual or some other kinds of means where they end up controlling the infrastructure creates a large bias against regional small banks and finance institutions. Okay. Michael, I saw you taking notes. Yeah, What's on your mind? I, I think <coughs> that, um, you know, going back to, I was involved in the 2013-2014 uh, at Treasury um, in the Quaker one of Johnson Crapo for the, those of you know, and, and um, the platform was not a hugely controversial issue back then. The platform for securitization. Uh, the securitization platform. I mean, there was talk about it being a utility uh, to lower barriers to entry into the market, uh, to provide direct access to the secondary market, not just having it owned by Fannie and Freddie. Um, the, the issues that tanked uh, bipartisan reform, and remember there was a bill that came out of the Senate uh, Banking Committee, 13 to 9 in favor of it, never got to the floor, was A, how much capital is necessary behind the guarantee because that has a direct effect on pricing, number one. Number two, how is the reform system going to address broad access and affordability, duty to serve, and affordable housing. And there was political divide uh, over that issue. And uh, that, that debate will continue. Um, but we have 10, the Senate Banking Committee, where the bipartisan effort uh, really begins to take hold, is 23 members, 10 of whom are new post-election. Um, so we've had a dramatic change um, in the composition there. And um, so whether the same issues will hold it up, but clearly how to address affordable housing um, within a reform system is going to be, again, a critical issue on whether you can get broad bipartisan support. Right. Uh, the guarantee issue is not in the Senate Banking Committee is not going to be an issue. It could still be an issue on the House, but my sense is that if you get a strong majority coming out of the Senate, the House will uh, go along with a guarantee. Okay, Jaron. Do yep. you have something? Richard, you guys <coughs> duke this out. Who wants to go first? Oh, go ahead. Okay, no, no, I would say that, first of all, it's important to understand there has been reform. Reform has occurred. Explain, <laughs> explain. Okay. In, ba in so, basic terms, what do okay, you mean? Okay, so in, in the, during the crises or right around that time in 2008, reform of Fannie and Freddie occurred. It was 10 years in the making, the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. FHFA is a whole new regulator, newly empowered with all kinds of authorities out of that law. 10 years in the making with all the key stakeholders involved. So there has been reform. In addition, Dodd-Frank has overall, I mean, we have qualified mortgages rules, ability to repay standards, enhanced capital, you know, whole set of reforms out of Dodd-Frank. Reform has occurred. And in addition, there have been additional administrative reforms. So it's back to what Ron said, you know, it's the ideologues versus the pragmatist. And that's all <laughs> political, okay? and. You know, the pragmatist might say, do we really need to overhaul this system? Or does this credit grant guarantee system really work? It works, okay? Maybe, that, you know, reform is still underway. They, they're, they're building a capital securitization uh, platform. Uh, Fannie and Freddie already hold, are already charging the market for far more capital than the 45 basis point pre-crisis. Pre the bottom line is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have always been controversial. There's always been a battle about, about them. And the current debate is all about refighting those battles that have already existed, you know, which are ideological. Richard, is it that simple? <laughs> uh, no, so you asked why are we having such a hard time okay. getting <laughs> things done, and mortgages are complicated. Yeah. Um, there are so many options embedded, particularly American mortgages, that figuring out how to deliver a product that is so hard to price is, I think, a fundamental problem. So I, I just want to comment on 
to Mike's point, I mean, the way to think about it, I think, is you have the Hensherling people, you have the Elizabeth Warren people, and then you have some people in between. <coughs> Stitching together half of any of those groups is a very hard thing. So, so uh, Henserling is anti-GSE. Let's just throw it out to the private market. I'm, I'm generalizing yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth Warren is, we have to take care of the low moderate income. We also have to make sure that the home buyer is protected and doesn't get like exploding loans. Um, but the middle is much bigger than both of those people. So, and yet somehow we can't seem to stitch. Well, that's tell us why. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a political question. I'm, I'm, I'm no, I, I, it just, as, as Mike was describing the process, it, it just occurred to me. Um, but the other thing I just want to, on, on the issue of did the private sector develop infrastructure for securitization that worked, I, I, I do have to take issue with that because clearly it didn't. And one of the big issues was governance inside the securities. And so you had all these conflicts as there was tranching in the private label MBS when stuff started going bad um, that suggests that if there were some sort of utility where governance was really well established, um, and I think Ginny May has done a very good job of that, that might be an important ingredient in terms of going forward. And we still have, we're still having problems with the securitization system. Nine years later, there are still problems with these private label securities and how they're managed the contracts, right? Like it's yeah. still a mess. Yeah, yeah. Haven't I, yep. I, 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 since Richard's responding to my, my yep. comment, obviously, obviously I have a different view on that. Um, I think, I think the issue is, is that um, we need to, we need to bifurcate the concepts of regulation versus the concepts of infrastructure. The issues that Richard spoke of in reference to, and we have alluded to it earlier, is significant reps and warranties issues. There was a major problem in the private label securities market before that. But the industry and it, through the, uh, uh, you know, 2.0 and 3.0 initiatives that have taken place within the industry itself, with SFIG and SIFMA and folks of those uh, putting together and fully recognizing that there was a problem with the mechanics of the regulation and the lack of self-policing uh, was not appropriate. That is different than infrastructure issues. And infrastructure issues meaning the essence of where you take your mortgages, who pays for them, who gives you a market rate for them, how can you take that security called a TBA and forward trade that so that you can uh, uh, forward merge your book. That's infrastructure. That's totally different than policy regulation. And I completely agree with uh, Richard that policy um, integration needed to be improved. It's being improved. And it's that lack of perception of policy integration, which is why that market hasn't taken off yet. But that does not mean you have to reconstruct the plumbing to support bad regulation and bad policy. Okay, so so let's uh, let's talk about where we are today and and where we can go now. Um, the housing market, to a lot of people, looks pretty good. Prices are going up. Um, the economy is doing okay. Uh, you know, from inside the Beltway, I guess the housing market looks healthy. Uh, but as we all know, there's a new crisis looming, which is the uh, which is the uh, lack of inventory, um, high price of rentals. Builders aren't building. So uh, is, are these things part of the GSC reform conversation, or are these things outside the GSC reform conversation? Who wants to go first? I, I'm I think, they're, you know, I think they're, they're, they're really both. I mean, the GSCs are part and parcel of part of the solution. OK, it's like what I said. I mean, you're in an environment. The, you know, 50-year low on home ownership. I mean, you're you're in an environment, like I said, with declining federal support, but that would answer some of help answer some of those issues. And so, having the GSCs in the market, uh, outside of conservatorship, able to use their they're even more profitable today than you know than they were pre-crisis. I mean, having being able to use some of their know-how and their profits to try to mitigate some of those issues would help. 
it's not the entire answer, uh, but we are in an environment of shrinking federal resources and, um, you know, an evolving tax discussion. And so some of those issues could be mitigated. But Richard, are we asking yeah. the GSEs to do too much? Well, I, I have to divide the answer into two parts. I think if, if you look at the decline in the homeownership rate among minorities, yeah. that, is, that does relate to how GSEs have been behaving. And in particular, I think a big issue facing mortgage lending more broadly is there are at least 40 million adults in the U.S. that don't have a FICO score. That doesn't mean they have a bad FICO score. It means they have no FICO score. These are disproportionately two groups of people, old people. So like my parents are of a generation where they paid off their mortgage and they don't like using credit cards, or people who belong to ethnic and racial minorities. Now, if think about a person who has lived to age 35, renting, paying their utilities, paying their Verizon bill, are they a good credit risk or a bad credit risk? Okay, well, actually I've run some numbers. They're a good credit risk, but there is nothing right now in the underwriting machinery to take into account these people who sort of fall outside the traditional realm of mortgage underwriting. So I'm not saying we should be making loans to people who can't pay them back. We should <coughs> not do that again. But we need to rethink how we're doing underwriting based on um, the reality of the way people are living their lives right now. And, and I think across the board institutions have not done a good job of that. So that's part of GSE reform in uh, your mind? I, I, th I think so. Ron? But, on the, just one, but just quickly on the other side, where I do worry about, though, is in places where, like where I live, California, which are very supply constrained, is if you have lots more capital coming into the mortgage market, all that will do is cause prices to rise even further because you won't get a supply response because of the local regulatory conditions. Wow. Ron? Well, I think, you know, one of the things, though, that, that impacts the GSE's ability to do more is the fact that they're trying to manage their businesses so that they don't have to take a draw. I mean, they're managing their business. If you're, if you're the CFO or the CEO of those companies, um, you know, you don't want to have to take a draw because of, you know, some, you know, some something you did wrong, some loan blows up, something blows up. I mean, one loan blowing up isn't going to take tax them down. Tax reform. But tax reform, I mean, there's all kinds of things. And so if you're, if you're a going concern that has ample amounts of, of capital, then you look for ways to deploy that capital in a responsible manner. That would help with obviously creating, you know, new programs, you know, uh, more outreach, things of that nature. But if they don't have a lot of capital, they're not going to take a lot of risk. So as long as they're in conservatorship, we're not going to see a lot of innovation. Well, I, I really, um, really like some of the things Jerron just said and, and, and Ron as well and would like to echo the fact that in my mind that the biggest issue that we're facing is lack of private capital in the market. And, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to sound like a Ronco commercial here for a minute, but uh, <laughs> we recently uh, published a 54-page, uh, we call it the Blueprint for GSE Safety and Soundness, and you can find that at uh, gsesafetyandsoundness.com. But uh, moving away from that, um, I think one of the biggest issues that has caused this credit box not to open is because we don't have private capital. And the reason we don't have private capital is because the conversations to this point are completely broken down in references to, A, how much private capital do you need? Where is that private capital going to come from? How is that going to be priced? How is that going to be regulated? There has been substantial policy papers written on this topic over the last few years, but in particular over the last six to seven months. And most of the policy papers that address these issues do not have any substantive mathematics in them, and they do not have anything that actually spells out the answers to these questions. How much do you have to pay for private capital? And then once you, and then who are these people called private capital? It's just this not done a blob of something that just floats across Wall Street. You have to define it. You have to create a product that fits the people to put their needs and wants them to put their money into it. And yet you have to all do that in a circumstance where you have appropriate reform and you have appropriate legislative authority going forward to look at what's the right way for the housing finance system to work. But until you define this basic question, of how much capital, where it's going to come from, 
and who's going to pay for it, you can't solve this question. And until you solve that question, you can't raise the FICO scores from 740 back down to 680. Okay, and, so I'm... And let me, let me just add on the multifamily side, <laughs> the issue of which you also raised, you know, I mean, there the issue of gap financing, soft subsidies, and, and who fills in that gap. So a lot of deals bring a lot of sources of funding together, and the GSEs play a big role on multifamily too. So it's not, but I'm, but again, that that also has something to do with the federal appropriations budget picture and tax policy as well. But I'm saying the GSEs also play a role. Right, right, they're everywhere. Um, so I'm sure this is raising as many questions as it's answering. Uh, any any questions from the audience? So the, the question is, why did Watt pay that divi the latest dividend I, I, to Treasury? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's trying to measure the politics here. It was a new administration, and I still think he might act, and he said he might act. And, you know, January 2018 is D-Day. Um, I still think he could act later this year, but I think... You know, he's measuring the politics uh, with the Treasury and on the Hill, and I think he is still holding out the hope by sending those very clear signals that assent can be a re reached, that we, you know, there yeah. can be a consensus that builds, particularly since in his testimony, much to my yeah. chagrin, really, uh, he bifurcated the issues. He said rebuilding capital mm -hmm. does not mean a release from conservatorship. It's just rebuilding capital so that the market gets the right message. So I, I think the reason he didn't is because he's still <laughs> hoping for a consensus to be built. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's just um, break it down to kind of the kind of political risk involved in the Buffett disappearing and having zero capital versus what that means to the marketplace. The marketplace has known for years, because it's contractual, that the actual retained capital was going to go to zero in 2018. The market has known that for five years. And as we approach January 2018, spreads have not changed. The investors are looking to the capital that stands behind the GSEs that has already been uh, essentially kind of obligated and appropriated by Congress, which stands today at $258 billion, right? That is the amount that is backing the guarantees and so on. The question is, um, how does the prospect of a draw, right, affect the affordable housing stuff? And that debate that he had, a colloquy he had with Watt had with Corker and Crapo was really very interesting, but he, he, Watt, certainly indicated that if he can't get Treasury to go along right, he's going to do it. I don't know when and I don't know why he didn't. Um, it is possible that um, given the prospects of the debt ceiling uh, issue coming out and, you know, coming around that um, Treasury needs those dollars and maybe treasury will be willing to reconsider maybe after the debt ceiling is debt right the debt limit issue is addressed and maybe you get it in the end of the the, the fourth quarter rather than or, you know the third quarter rather than the fourth quarter it would be paid in the fourth it would be withheld in the fourth quarter because there's a, a quarter lag right uh, but who knows but certainly uh, director watt has indicated that he doesn't want to take that risk of letting them go to zero. So it seems to me that he has laid out his 
What surprised me was Treasury Mnuchin did not have to oppose it at his hearing the next week, but he chose to. And the question is, he could have, Treasury, I mean, we stayed silent on a lot of issues that were not directly in our bailiwick, right? I mean, this is a what issue. Uh, he could do it unilaterally. Treasury chose to oppose it. Um, and I suspect that could change after the, the debt is addressed. Another question in the back. Census for a secured wrap, uh, a full faith and credit backing of a of a security. It seems to me two two things to, to I'd like to get some discussion on. One is we've got a lot of safety and sound soundness experience in this country with institutions. I don't think we've got a lot of experience with full faith and credit on securities. And secondly, um, and maybe Land or someone else can talk about this. My understanding is that banks, too, too big to fail banks, have to carry capital, different levels of capital based on the security. So if it's a Ginny Mae security, they hold, which is full faith and credit, they hold no capital. If it's a GSE security, they hold 20% capital. So if we smoke, if we just sprinkle some, some pixie dust on these securities, the banks have a great capital arbitrage we're pushing this administration to lower capital requirements. This seems to me to be a perfect backhanded way to do that. Is that, is that a wise, safe, mm. and soundest direction to go? Thank you. Hmm. Landon? Mike? Mike. I, 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 um, right now, we have an implicit guarantee. There is that spread between Ginny's and the, right, and the MBS <coughs> and, the, and the GSEs. Um, Given that spread, it has been accepted globally by investors, uh, right, uh, across, right? Uh, and we need, in a reform system, we have to be able to attract capital from outside, uh, from investors, if we want to have enough capital at affordable, at affordable prices. So the question is, should that guarantee be implicit or explicit. Um, we think as a matter, I think as a matter of principle, it should be full faith and credit and priced at the, and, and, and right, actuarially priced and at the security level so that we're not really guaranteeing uh, institutions that can take risks and then put it on the taxpayers if, if those big bets Fails. It should be at the security level. So an explicit guarantee is the pixie explicit. dust. Explicit. Yeah. Right. Uh, Does everybody think we need an explicit guarantee, government guarantee? Well, I think one thing that we need to um, <clears throat> be careful of is, in, in, and, and I personally think it's one of the reasons why this discussion is so drawn out, <laughs> is <clears throat> we oftentimes use different words to describe the same thing. and different words that describe different things. Um, and they're not necessarily harmonious on, and in the conversation or on this panel itself. Uh, for example, I do not believe that we are currently in a system of an implicit guarantee. We have a $258 billion backstop, which is in the form of the preferred but the market agreement. doesn't necessarily agree with that. That $258 billion is very explicit. It says that the United States government is agreed to put in common, agreed to put in preferred dividends with a 10% coupon up to $258 billion. It has not been written down any place that there is a implicit guarantee on that debt, nor has there ever been. So Why what the spread? We, but what we have now is we have an explicit guarantee. Mm. Now the difference why we have a, a trading spread between Fannie's and Freddie's mm -hmm. and Ginny's, which is typically about 20 basis points in spread, which based on, uh, for mortgage geeks, around a six year to seven year duration translates into about a point to a point and a half in uh, dollar price between certificates at any one point in time for the same coupon, is based on the fact, as, as the questioner in the back had noted, on risk-based capital. 
Ginnies, because they're backed by full faith and credit, get zero capital. That means if you're a bank, you can buy them and invest in them and not hold any capital against them. That means you can fund them and finance them for your REIT customers and other customers with no capital associated with the repos that you put against that. At compared to Fannie's and Freddie's, which attract a 20% uh, 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 risk capital rating. So the real difference between Fannie's and Freddie's is not the fact that there's an implicit guarantee. Most of that arbitrage between the two of them is because of the risk-based capital impact. And that risk-based capital impact, if you were to take and make Fannie's and Freddie's peri passu with Ginny's, meaning that they have the same Every, all the same exact terms. What that means is that Ginny's will trade off, that Ginny's will have a higher credit spread associated with them because they will have lost their scarcity value. Ginny's, Ginny's are more in demand because they're more useful to the banks. So question for Mike. So um, you know, the MEA's got a proposal out there which uh, has a lot of the features I think you were, you were talking about. Um, one of the reasons why I think MBA has been so adamant that you need legislative reform is to really get to a stable foundation for the market going forward. But some of your co-panelists uh, have been asserting that you can get further with administrative reform uh, without getting legislation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And then also, what, what do you think are, are some of the risks there? I mean, we, we've been hearing some potential names for a new FHFA director, which could take administrative reform very far, but in a, in a very different direction than Director Watt has gone. Here are your thoughts on those, those conversations. Yeah, um, carrying the infrastructure of a conservatorship forward over the long term, that means the preferred stock purchase agreements, the contracts, the $258 billion was really there why, right to make sure that the market remained liquid while reform was, permanent reform was going to take place to extend essentially that system with all of the constraints and the markets, again, it's the market perception of uh, too big to fail uh, where we end up um, not charging for that implicit guarantee is just not the basis for a sound and stable and sustainable system in our view going going forward with respect to the affordable with it, with respect to the affordable housing duty to serve that broad regime <coughs> even though it is locked into HERA and legislation today the conservator who is the FHFA director has broad discretion um, and as will the uh, as does Treasury in concert with the FHFA director in modifying the contract and uh, they can suspend the affordable right that 4.2 basis point fee uh, they can narrow duty to serve I mean who sits in that position is very important and uh, my view is we ought to try to lock in as much of that affordable housing obligation of the secondary market system in legislation, not leaving it to the whims of who the next FHFA director is going to be. Go ahead, I, I do, I do want to add on, on this whole implicit versus explicit question. First of all, both uh, the FHF director Watt and Secretary Mnuchin were asked this specific question. And I just want to point out, they were inconclusive on it. Well, that's a, pol that's a political decision is, I think, what they well, were trying I mean, to say, right? It's, yeah, so, I mean, they, yeah. they, well, I don't know, but, I mean, the bottom line is the, the DAS asked senators, mm -hmm. asked them, do we need an explicit guarantee? FHFA hasn't developed a position on that. Secretary Mnuchin said it's too early to tell. I mean, the two authorities were inconclusive on it. I mean, you know, think, I mean, I think there are a lot of, of, of other experts and think tanks in town who have a different view, but I'm just saying that's what they said. That secondly, it is also, I think it's important to mention that 
an explicit guarantee does not does not ju uh, it, it can be done without legislating it. It can be done without legislating it. An explicit guarantee can also be achieved administratively. I, and um, I, I would say on the affordable so. housing dynamic. Well, anyway, okay, Ron. Yeah, I you know I think that the thing about uh, administrative reform versus uh, legislative. Um, <laughs> The reality is that the administrative reform, the director, the administrative reforms, at least that we've advocated for, and I think that most people are talking about, actually lead to more about safety and soundness, and that is around the capital issue. And the director has that authority. It's in HERA. You know, that fight was fought, you know, 10 years ago. And so that's there. And so we certainly believe that that should be exercised. The director needs to be able to do that. And I think, you know, his comments at that hearing, he was the safety and soundness director saying, I need to take action and, you know, hoping that he will be able to work with Treasury to do that. Um, you know, the, the issue about explicit versus implicit, um, I think you also need to understand that, you know, this guarantee, how is it accessed? When is it accessed? And I think that was sort of one of the other questions that came up through the, uh, during the whole Johnson Crapo, Corker Warner, various uh, other iterations. And that, you know, our vision is that that guarantee is something that it's out there, but it's a lot of, there's a lot of private capital in front of it. You've got the borrower's capital, you've got MI insurance there, if it's, an, if it's an MI loan, and then you've got the capital of the guarantor that's in standing in front of it. In our, in our view, it's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, well capitalized, and you should not breach that, that bulwark at all to get to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to that guarantee. That guarantee is catastrophic. And so I really believe, though, that that needs to be out there because the market needs to see, and that's the secret sauce that makes the mortgage-backed securities market work is that traders know, hey, it's a Freddie, it's a Fannie, it's a Ginny. They can price it. They understand the risk. They understand the product. And that's why the TBA market works. Pixie Dust. We had a question in the back. Um, so you guys have Wait for the microphone. Thank you. So I, I feel like there's a pretty broad acceptance that everyone wants more access to credit and pretty much everyone wants increased participation by the enterprises. So with the QM patch set to expire in 2021, how do you maintain access to credit while also decreasing participation by the enterprises? So, someone start by explaining what the QM patch is. Sure. Go ahead, Ron. So the QM patch, for those who don't know, is, is uh, it actually is called the GSE patch. And uh, basically uh, what the CFPB said when they issued the 2013 uh, QM rule was that if a loan has been scored through either of the GSE's underwriting engines and you've documented that loan accordingly, that that loan will get QM safe harbor treatment. And that provides benefits to obviously the originator. Uh, it also allows you to exceed the 43% debt to income ratio. Uh, and and that, those benefits actually transfer to the originator even if they don't sell the loan to the GSE. So they could do all that, keep it in portfolio, and still get QM safe harbor treatment. That's supposed to expire either in 2021 or when the GSEs are released from conservatorship, whichever occurs first, which is probably going to be 2021. That is <laughs> controlled solely by, at this point, by the director of, uh, of the CFPB. And so obviously they have to change it. And we're advocating for that to be made permanent. Yeah. Uh, go, Richard, and then we'll go to our next question. Oh, no, just yeah. is, uh, I mean, part of it is the QM rule just should be changed. The 43% rule is just a bad rule. There's no foundation in data for that rule. I mean, think about, you have one mortgage that has identical characteristics at 42.9 and another at 43.1, and one is okay and the other isn't. That's just a silly rule that you would have a bright line determination of what's a QM and what isn't. Yeah. Just the, um, I mean, uh, the 43% um, was in lieu of being able to find compensating factors. And, um, but it's not just 2021. Um, there's a five year, right, revisit. Um, or so that's occurring now. That's occurring now. Right, right. Uh, CFPB is reviewing 
the ability to repay rule in QM, and we'll, we'll see that happening um, over the next 18 months. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, on, on the explicit guarantee, uh, Craig, Craig Phillips apparently uh, made some remarks about it at the event. I, I wasn't there, but I, I, I have a feeling y'all have you know, at least sought clarification since, since he made those remarks. Um, is, does he have a, a, a view that there needs to be an explicit guarantee on, on conforming of the others? My understanding is that in response to a question at a, at a conference, that he did say that. Um, now, Mnuchin has not said that, uh, but my understanding is that Craig did. Landon, what do you think Craig is missing? I think everybody at this point sort of believes that the whatever guarantee is in place should be explicit, and it should be paid for. Um, the idea of the, of the free rider kind of status that Fannie and Freddie had back in the bad days, or the good old days from their perspective, um, is um, not appropriate. What the real issue is about, um, about uh, the guarantee at this point, is it a full guarantee wrapped around MBS, or is it a limited guarantee wrapped around the companies themselves or some other um, avenue. Now, the wrap around the full MBS guarantee, um, the market has never had before. Um, so that would be a new step in a new direction to have an explicit full guarantee. Uh, the big issue at the end of the day, though, between <coughs> a MBS guarantee and a corporate guarantee is that on the current uh, balance sheets of the two entities, if you were to look at them on a merged basis, they have $700 billion of agency debt. And that's not MBS, that's just debt. And that corporate unsecured debt provides two extremely important functions to the housing market. The first thing they do is it provides the cash that makes the securitization machine works, that allows Ron's constituents to sell mortgages to the cash <coughs> window. You need to provide some sort of financing <coughs> mechanism for that to continue in today's system. The second thing it does is it buys back out of MBS delinquent mortgages typically when they become 60 days past due. And that is extremely important because what that allows is that allows for steady, predictable prepayments of the underlying yeah. Fannies and Freddies, which allows them to be traded in what's called the rates market, which brings basically uh, near government security. So that is extremely important, and that's an issue that's being tied up in his, then that nuance gets lost, because if you guarantee only the MBS and not have any guarantee on the entity itself, the cost of funds on this very critical cash that makes the Fannie and Freddie window work would go up. And so that's something that needs to be addressed, and it's being lost in this discourse between whether it's a full guarantee or a limited guarantee. Okay, so Landon gets the last word. Thanks very much. I think we could probably talk about this for the next nine years. Um, <laughs> hopefully we won't be. And Greg? So Greg Morrow, uh, I'm the director of the Sands Institute uh, of Real Estate at Pepperdine. Uh, we are just very pleased to be able to co-host this event with our colleagues in the policy school, public policy school. Uh, I think this is actually the ideal of what universities can do, is bring together constituents across, uh, across the aisle and across uh, different areas to debate these things. Everybody knows each other. In some cases, it's the first time people are actually meeting each other, even though they're, they've been debating these policies. Uh, I think this was a very good conversation. We, we touched on some big issues, some top-level top stuff, uh, even questioning whether the 30-year fixed is the, is the right product. But we also got down into the weeds about how this uh, GSE reform can happen. So uh, just wanted to thank our panel, thank uh, to Jerron, to Richard, Michael, uh, Landon, and Ron. Uh, thanks to Lorraine for, for questioning and moderating. Uh, so if everybody could just join me in giving everybody a hand, that'd be great. Thank you.